Welcome to Health Watch, presented by Novant Health. I'm your host, June Baker. Our show features local physicians and health professionals discussing health topics of importance to local residents. Today, we welcome back Dr. Lee Toller of Brunswick Women's Center. Dr. Toller will be talking with us about a type of minimally invasive hysterectomy. Then, we will meet Dr. Mark Foster, who specializes in orthopedics and spine surgery. Finally, we will meet Dr. Scott Calhoun, who will talk with us about a new option in knee replacement. Stay tuned to learn about valuable health topics with HealthWatch. Our first guest is Dr. Lee Toller of Brunswick Women's Center. Dr. Toller, welcome back to the show. Oh, thank you. Thank well, you. It's, it's good to be back. It's a pleasure to have you again. Oh, thanks. And it's great to see you. And so for our viewers who haven't met you previously, tell us a little bit about your practice. Uh, I'm a, an OBGYN with Brunswick Women's Center, uh -huh. uh, which is a four-person group. Uh, we do um, obstetrics and gynecology as well as uh, surgeries, uh, some outpatient surgeries and inpatient surgeries as well. Mm -hmm. So we offer, uh, try to offer the spectrum of anything, uh, any care that, women specific care that would be needed. Mm -hmm. um, well, our main focus for the interview today is uh, about minimally invasive hysterectomy. Mm -hmm. So let's start with the basics. What okay. is a minimally invasive hysterectomy? That's hard to say. It is hard to say. <laughs> uh, with a traditional abdominal hysterectomy, mm -hmm. Uh, which is the kind that uh, up to 80% of women were having uh, a few years ago. Right. Uh, the doctor would come in and make a fan and steel incision like when you get a C-section. Uh -huh. uh, go in and do the hysterectomy that way. It's an open procedure. Mm -hmm. The problem is it's a pretty big incision. Right. Uh, there is more disruption of tissue. You have to stay in the hospital longer. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's, it's a longer recovery time. Uh, with the minimally invasive, we do it through the laparoscope. You've probably talked to people who've had their gallbladder taken out laparoscopically. Mm -hmm. And you know, they make uh, two or three small ports instead of the big incision. Mm -hmm. uh, with this, we're able to make, again, three, usually three or four small incisions instead of the one great big one. So, mm -hmm. um, we, go ahead. And what would be the benefits of a minimally invasive hysterectomy as opposed to the, the regular one? Mm -hmm. Um, for the minimally invasive hysterectomy, the big benefit is a shorter recovery time. Mm -hmm. um, the uh, the laparoscopic, the, the fantasteel incision is a big incision, mm -hmm. and it is hard to get over. Uh, you're looking at three days in the hospital with that. We can usually have you in the hospital overnight, go home the next day. Wow. Uh, back to real life, four to six, we say four to six weeks still, but most people feel very, very well within one to two weeks. Really? Although I do caution people against heavy lifting for six weeks, mm -hmm. regardless. Uh, it, it's much, much shorter recovery time. So you cut the hospital stay almost by two days? Yes. Yeah. Wow. But it's, it, they're both about four to six weeks, though. As I still tell people four to six weeks to take time off. Mm -hmm. um, the thing that actually gets people in trouble uh, after the surgery is because it is so minimally invasive and they feel great afterwards. Mm -hmm. So they want to go out and start moving furniture and uh, going back to regular life. And then they find out that their body is not quite ready for that yet. Um, so that's actually a lot of the pre-op teaching I do is to caution people to take it easy at least the first couple of weeks afterwards. Because they feel too good they and feel they start they, doing things that they shouldn't be doing. They actually right? do feel too good, mm -hmm. which is a good problem to have. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, I'm curious how long the procedures <clears throat> take, uh, the typical um, abdominal hysterectomy mm -hmm. versus the minimally invasive time-wise. What is the difference between those two? It takes a little bit longer to do the laparoscopic hysterectomy. It does? I would think it would be the opposite. You'd think so. Uh, but we have to do a little bit of setup first where we replace the ports. Mm -hmm. And there's also a couple of devices we have to hook up for that. Right. Plus the incisions we're using are smaller, so the instruments are smaller. Um, the instruments we're using are like the size of my little finger. Uh -huh. So compared to the traditional scalpel and uh, scissors and the clamps that we use, which are probably more like this size, they take much smaller bites. So it just takes a little longer oh, to do I that. Oh, I see. Yeah, that makes uh, sense. It still only takes, it probably adds, well, I'll make it sound like it's taking a lot of extra time, but you're probably adding half an hour of operating time, uh, usually about an hour and a half for the procedure, uh, total time in surgery. For the minimally invasive? For the minimally invasive, yes. And the other one, would it take about an hour and a half too? 
Uh, theoretically, about an hour, between an hour to an hour and a half. There's not a large so, difference so, in the time. So basically about the same. About the same. But much better for the patient if they're a, if they're a good candidate. If they're a good candidate right. for that. Is everyone a candidate for minimally invasive hysterectomy? No, actually there are some people who are going to be better served uh, mm -hmm. by a traditional abdominal hysterectomy, but those are pretty rare. Uh, patients with very large uterine fibroids mm -hmm. uh, are not always good candidates for that just because the size of the uterus is so big that you need to make a large incision to be able to remove it. Remove it. Uh, mm -hmm. But most, most hysterectomies, probably 80% or more, can be done laparoscopically. Um, so that, that's the mm -hmm. very few, honestly, very, very rarely do I do an abdominal, an open hysterectomy. Really? So, hmm. Well, that's interesting. How about risks and side effects of minimally invasive? Are there any risks? Anytime you do a hysterectomy, the biggest risk is bladder injury. The uterus mm -hmm. is like a big muscle, mm -hmm. and the bladder is like a, I think of it as a bag of water. And they're separate mm -hmm. at the top, but at the bottom they lay together like this. Mm -hmm. You have to peel wow. the bladder back a little bit uh -huh. to get the uterus out. So the bladder is actually attached to the uterus at the bottom. Oh, it is? Mm -hmm. and so in the process of detaching the bladder, there's always a risk of injury to the bladder mm -hmm. because you are just connecting this tissue here, taking it apart. Um, again, the risk is rare, and since we are very well aware of it, we are extra careful to, to do our best to make sure that nobody ever has a problem there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I didn't realize they were attached and yeah. I had to take them apart. Right, that's something that uh, you don't think about until you mm -hmm. until you get in there and actually start looking at the the actual specifics of the procedure. Mm -hmm. so. Now, once the uterus is gone, what happens to the bladder? That's a good question. It's actually still there. The bladder's still attached to the back of the pelvis. It doesn't fall down. No, it doesn't fall out or anything <laughs> like that. No, <laughs> that's a very good question. <laughs> I'm and then, curious about uh, And then we like actually that. close up the uh, the top of the vaginal cuff. Uh -huh. um, and the bladder sits close to the top of that, but uh -huh. there, we don't, for, we're very lucky, we don't have very few problems with adhesions. There's not tissue sticking to each other. The bladder is still um, sort of attached, almost like a sling. Mm. And we, it's just an area probably two or three centimeters at the bottom that we actually have to detach. So, oh, okay. Uh. <laughs> well, that's <laughs> that's great, a good question. Great information. Uh. Um, are there any other types of specialized procedures or services that you offer that our viewers might not be aware of? Uh, another procedure that we offer people, a lot of times people come to talk to me about a hysterectomy. Now, the minimally invasive hysterectomy is still a hysterectomy, which does have the risk we talked about. Sometimes patients are candidates for less invasive procedures. Mm -hmm. Now, there's something else we do called an endometrial ablation, which is where you uh, burn the lining of the uterus mm -hmm. uh, so that the bleeding stops. It will actually oh. decrease or stop menstrual cycles without having to remove the uterus. Uh, there's less risk of injury. Mm -hmm. uh, it is less invasive and the recovery time is uh, outpatient. You actually get to go home that same evening. Oh, that would be a plus. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, it's definitely, if you're, if you're the right candidate for it, which unfortunately not everyone is, mm -hmm. but if you're the right patient for it and you and everything checks out okay for that, it's a great procedure. Mm -hmm. And that would be something that you would have a discussion with the patient and together you would decide right. which uh, procedure is best for that patient. Right, a discussion and an examination will usually help us to tell which patients are the most appropriate for which procedure. So. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I, of course I try to give everybody the least, the sure. least invasive procedure that it's gonna get uh, the results that they need. Right, so. and you give them all the information so that they can make uh, a wise choice. Correct. Yeah. Well, again, um, it's it's great to have you here in Brunswick County. Uh, I'm sure that um, uh, our, your patients are very happy that you're here. Oh, uh, thank you. <laughs> I know your practice is a, has a great reputation, and I'm real happy that uh, that you're here with them. Now, if our patients or if our viewers out there would like to make an appointment, how might they do that? Well, the simplest way is just to call the office. We have uh, three locations, but we do all of our appointments through a central location. Uh, the telephone number is 754 9166. Mm -hmm. uh, and call there, and they can set us up for an appointment at our supply office, our Leland office, or our Sea Trail office. So yeah. that makes it very convenient for all the ladies in the, right. in the area. Um, right having them as far north as Leland and as far south as... Um, right. Brunswick County is a big county. It is a very big county. So we're trying it? to keep our patients from having to travel, to right. travel so far. And yeah. I'm sure they're, they're happy about that. Absolutely. Well, again, thank you so much for being here. We look forward to hearing from you again. Oh, thank you. Thank you. You're I enjoy welcome. I appreciate it. 
Our next guest is Dr. Mark Foster, an orthopedic and spine surgeon who's new to our area. Welcome to the show, Dr. Foster. It's such a pleasure to have you here. Thank you. It's great to be here. Good, good. Um, I'd like to begin by learning a little bit more about you and your education and your background. Um, can you tell me where you went to school and where you did your residency? Sure. Uh, my undergraduate degree was from Clemson and then uh, medical school, attended medical school in Charleston. Mm -hmm. And uh, following that, I was there for another five years doing my orthopedic training. Um, immediately following my residency in Charleston, um, I participated in a foot and ankle fellowship. That was an additional year of training uh -huh. in Milwaukee for uh -huh. foot and ankle surgery. And then uh, following that, I've done, a, I've done a spine surgery fellowship, another portion of training that was done in Chapel Hill. Mm -hmm. Well, tell me about, uh, about your practice and what, you're, what it offers and where you're located. The, uh, the practice, I'm joined orthopedic specialist, mm -hmm. and our main office is in Southport. And though we have offices in Sunset Beach and Leland, and then another office in Supply, mm -hmm. the, um, I practice with three other orthopedists, and uh, we provide uh, orthopedic care across the whole spectrum. And um, my major contribution to the practice is that for foot and ankle surgery as well as uh, sp care of the spine, surgery and non-surgical treatment of the spine. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I understand that that's going to be a new specialty for Brunswick Novant Medical Center, you, you bringing that new specialty of spine surgery. Um, tell me a little bit about the basic types of spine surgery. Well, uh, over the years, I've seen spine surgery um, uh, transition to more minimal, minimally invasive, invasive. yeah, mm -hmm. minimally invasive surgery with smaller incisions, shorter hospital stays. Sometimes mm -hmm. even outpatient spine surgery is an option. Wow. Um, the surgery might include uh, treatment of uh, compression fractures related to osteoporosis or mm -hmm. disc herniations with nerve compression, and sometimes. Uh, surgical treatment for the arthritic spine is an option. Would there be um, types of treatment or therapies that would be uh, offered prior to going to spine surgery? Oh, sure. And generally, we try to uh, arrange the treatment such that it's the uh, least risky treatment first, mm -hmm. less invasive, mm -hmm. such as uh, medications or physical therapy, sometimes even bracing. And then beyond that, uh, sometimes injection therapy is an option, such as cortisone injections. And um, if the person's quality of life deteriorates because of their pain or activity limitations, then we can certainly consider surgery as, as more or less a last resort once um, if non-surgical care has not been successful. Mm -hmm. So um, you wouldn't automatically take a patient uh, to spine surgery. You would recommend that you... Uh, go through all these other modalities first and then? Generally, that's true. If they have a profound weakness about their leg because of nerve compression, mm -hmm. um, sometimes it's, it's uh, the, actually a conservative thought to go ahead and operate on somebody really? because you wouldn't want that nerve to continue to get damaged oh, I see. and uh, lead to permanent weakness. Mm -hmm. But generally speaking, um, this, this, we start with... Um, non-surgical treatment, mm -hmm. and then if the patient's uh, condition doesn't respond favorably, can consider surgery beyond mm -hmm. that. Um, I know that <clears throat> many folks have heard that back surgery is difficult. It's, you know, may have had a hard recovery or so on and so forth. But I imagine surgery has evolved to such a point where it's probably less invasive, as you said, minimally invasive now. And things uh, you have smaller incisions so it's come a long way am I correct? You are correct in that in that regard the surgical treatment is I think it's most successful if we can align the patient's goals and expectations so they don't have unrealistic expectations mm -hmm. or I don't present things in an unrealistically achievable right. goal mm -hmm. um, so that if we can align expectations with what's actually achievable surgery is generally more successful and then making a, a uh, a decision for surgery uh, at the right time. If there, another c consideration would be the patient's overall health. If they have significant lung disease or heart disease, oh, true. Then, mm -hmm. then maybe the risk of surgery um, are not worth the potential benefits. Right. Hmm. Well, are these primarily um, inpatient procedures that we're talking about, or outpatient procedures, or can they be both? Well, again, the patient's overall health 
picture comes into play, as well as their social situation, whether or not they have a, care, a caretaker or spouse at mm -hmm. home, whether mm -hmm. or not they live in a one-story or two-story house. So sometimes they're there for pain control, sometimes for rehab. But I will say that over the years, um, even fusion surgery for spinal mm -hmm. instability, um, the hospital stay has gone from, say, five days to maybe two days, mm -hmm. and, um, and thus with better, better more, more well-designed equipment and the use of x-ray imaging, uh, we've been able to shorten the hospital stay, blood loss, and lower the complication rate. Mm -hmm. Well, speaking of complications, are there uh, specific risks um, that, that folks should be um, aware of prior to having spine surgery? Well, there are, you know, there are risks to any sure. surgical procedure, but um, in, the over, in the general picture, those would be the risk would include infection or bleeding, mm -hmm. things like that. But it, we do try to, it, we always administer antibiotics ahead of surgery to try to minimize the mm -hmm. chance for infection. But particular to spine surgery, um, their risk inc might include uh, nerve injury mm -hmm. um, that might be temporary or permanent. permanent. But usually by way of CAT scans and MRIs done ahead of time, we know the anatomy, we know where to be on the lookout for particular pitfalls or um, potential setbacks related, right. related to a patient's uh, particular procedure. Mm -hmm. Okay. That's good information. Um, in addition to the spine, I understand that you do a, a wide range of orthopedic procedures. Let's let's touch on some of those. Right. Well, in this in this in my particular in my practice uh, presently, um, I, I perform foot and ankle surgery. Maybe related to foot trauma, like a fractured heel, or maybe related to age-related conditions, or such as. Um, such as bunions or rheumatoid foot deformities, mm -hmm. deformities of the toes and, and foot in rheumatoid patients. Mm -hmm. And then other potential, uh, other common foot conditions that I might would see in my practice would include uh, sports injuries related to tendon tears or ankle sprains, mm -hmm. things like that. Mm -hmm. um, and also some of that just spills over into, into orthopedics in general, whether mm -hmm. it's a, a fracture or a, a sprain. Mm -hmm. And um, these procedures, uh, the spine procedures in particular, um, will you be doing those at Brunswick Novant Medical Center? Yes, I'll be performing those those procedures uh, exclusively there. Uh, the, um, please say that you know the hospital has invested uh, the time and energy to um, provide the equipment that's needed to uh, provide the most up-to-date procedures. Really, mm -hmm. so it did require uh, some additional equipment, a specific equipment for spine surgery. That's right, a special operating table and the use of an operating microscope and uh, other small equipment, small uh, equipment that's designed small for smaller incisions and, mm -hmm. and quicker recovery. Mm -hmm. And um, so you'll begin doing surgery in the next week or so? That's right. The equipment's arrived and uh, the hospital staff's been educated about the procedures, Great. both the, both the uh, operative portion of the procedures as well as the um, post-operative uh, procedures mm -hmm. such as physical therapy and nursing care. Dr. Foster, that's been, it's been great having you here. It was great information. But before we go, can you let our viewers know how they can schedule an appointment uh, with you? Sure. The, the main number at the office is uh, 457 Four seven eight nine, mm -hmm. and I'm in the office um, m Monday through Friday. Uh, though most Tuesdays and some of Thursdays, I'm in the operating room. Okay, great. Well, thank you again so much for being here. It's a pleasure. I hope to have you back real soon, and we'll uh, see how things are going for you. Thanks for the opportunity of being here. You're welcome. Our final guest of the day is Dr. Scott Calhoun of Wilmington Health. Welcome to the show, Dr. Calhoun. Um, it's a pleasure to have you here. Well, thank you. Thanks for inviting me. You're welcome. Um, let's start with uh, you and your education and your background. Tell me a little bit about that. Well, I'm, I'm from California, but I've done a lot of my training out east and in Georgia and Charleston, South Carolina and mm -hmm. Jacksonville, Florida. Then I was a Navy doctor for three years and, and really enjoyed wearing the uniform and serving my country and getting to travel and getting some good experience. Well, that's and, great. And, and then uh, came back to Jacksonville, Florida and started looking for jobs and my wife is also a physician and we, we 
just settled here in uh, southeastern North Carolina. Mm -hmm. um, where did you go to medical school? At the Medical College of Georgia in Augusta. Augusta. Yeah. And, and your residency? In Jacksonville, Florida. Internship in Charleston, South Carolina. Mm -hmm. and residency in Jacksonville, Florida. And you've just been around a little bit. Yeah, it's been fun. <laughs> I, I understand that you're located in two or three places. You have some satellite offices. Tell yep. me a little bit about that. Yes, ma'am. We have a satellite in the Brunswick Forest Clinic. Right. And uh, we also have a satellite up in Jacksonville. Being a, a former Navy doctor, oh. I, I really grew to, to, to appreciate taking care of young Marines. And, sure. And a lot of, the, of my sports medicine practice comes from those patients from the base. Mm -hmm. So that that's a, another clinic I, I enjoy. I'm sure you do. But it is a bit of a drive, but it's it's worth it. Mm -hmm. so. Great. Well, all that's, that's wonderful information. Thank you for sharing sure. uh, that valuable information about Wilmington Health. But the main uh, focus of our interview today is to learn more about that specialized type of uh, knee replacement that you offer. Um, first, Tell me um, how you decide a knee replacement is what's necessary. Well, it's usually after seeing a patient several times mm -hmm. and, and, and getting to know them and examining them and, and uh, looking at their radiographs and then beginning conservative treatment. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, conservative treatment consists of ice, heat, rubs, wraps, various anti-inflammatory medications, mm -hmm. pain medicine, uh, steroid injections, <laughs> joint lubrication injections. Wow. There's, there's a lot of, there are a lot of things we can do to help patients mm -hmm. without surgery. Right. But sometimes patients come in and they've already had all that or, mm -hmm. or I've been taking care of them for a few years and, and, and we've, we've exhausted all those conservative right. measures. And, and when patients start having night pain, when they, when they have pain with their activities of daily living, mm -hmm. when, they're, when they're unable to walk for fitness and take care of the rest of their body, uh, then it's time to consider joint replacement surgery. I see. I see. I didn't realize there were so many um, avenues prior to the surgery. There are, and, and we exhaust them, and our patients mm -hmm. appreciate that. I'm sure they do. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I understand that there's many different kinds of knees out there. There are. And um, so we're going to talk about uh, a new type of knee today and um, something that you offer. Um, I hear you're one of the first physicians in the nation to provide this type of knee surgery. That's right. And um, so I think it's called Visionaire Patient Match um, Technology. That's right. It's kind of cumbersome, but tell me what that is. Well, what we do is we try to match the, the size implants to the patient right. using an MRI, a limited study without a radiologist reading it, uh, and a, an x-ray. And the MRI and x-ray data gets fed into a computer and tells us exactly what size parts to use exactly how they need to be aligned and most importantly and I'll show you here it creates mm -hmm. these custom blocks to use during the procedure they're individually made for each patient to the anatomy of their knee and for instance if this is a patient's distal femur or the top of their knee joint right this block snaps on only one way mm -hmm. and then it allows us to make our first cut to go ahead and start the procedure on the right track. It also sets the rotation for the components on the mm -hmm. femur as well. We use something very similar for the tibia. And I, I still go ahead and double check things with some old-fashioned instruments just to make sure that maybe there's not been, a, make sure there hasn't been a mistake with the computer software and I, I mm -hmm. want to make sure everything's done right. but. These blocks are pretty accurate. Mm -hmm. I've been pretty pleased with them. Mm -hmm. Now, so are these particular things ordered prior to the surgery? Um, you do the MRI, and um, are these cut to fit prior to going to surgery? Yes, ma'am. We we get the you know the limited MRI and in, in the in the one full length X ray about three weeks prior to surgery. I see. And that gives the computer time to. Uh, reconstruct all the images and, and uh, make these on blocks that come sterile from the factory mm -hmm. and then we open them up on the back table with all the new parts and mm -hmm. we use them. So it's like a custom fit? It is a custom fit. Uh, so what might be benefits from using the Visionaire knee replacement in comparison to a regular knee replacement? There are a lot of benefits. Uh, First of all, in my hands, it cuts down on the surgery time tremendously. 
Oh, I never much, thought of that. It's much more efficient. Mm -hmm. It saves about 22 steps, roughly. <laughs> um, also, uh, there's less instrumentation or less invasive uh, type of measuring during the surgery. For instance, I don't have to drill a hole in the distal femur and run a rod up the femur to find out the alignment. Mm -hmm. I can simply put the block on instead. So it's, it's a little less invasive. Mm -hmm. And uh, I just think it's, it's a much more efficient way to do the procedure. There's a lot less instruments on the back table, so it's much easier for the OR staff and mm -hmm. the hospital. There's much less equipment to turn over. Mm -hmm. um, how long would this procedure take? The procedure takes, on average, about 45 minutes. To That's short. It, that, that, it's, uh, you know, I think it's enough time to do a good job. Right. But it's also efficient. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, it's, it's not uncommon to, to do one of these procedures on a thin patient with mm -hmm. not a whole lot of deformity in you know, a little over 30 minutes. Wow. But, and sometimes it can take up to an hour or so. Mm -hmm. But usually, on average, about, about 45, 45 minutes. minutes. That's not too bad, then. In, you know, 45 minutes, we're, we're putting in our closing sutures. Mm -hmm. And what would be the recovery time uh, for a patient, a typical patient getting one of these? What would be the typical rec recovery time? Well, the, the, the recovery time varies. Mm -hmm. and that's, sure does. And that's, that's something that I'm actually really ex um, interested and excited about because we've come a long ways in the last few months, mm -hmm. really. Uh, we had, we attack the patient's pain from a lot of different angles. Mm -hmm. During the surgery, we give them some IV Tylenol and then an IV anti-inflammatory. Uh, we also inject uh, medicines around the lining of the knee joint. And then at the conclusion, we put on a TENS unit. And all those different modalities really help a lot with pain. Those patients uh, getting these visionaires, you're able to do this procedure at Brunswick Novant Medical Center? Yes, ma'am. Uh, Brunswick Novant Medical Center has um, negotiated a contract with the company that offers this visionaire technology. Right. So they, they get a competitive price for the, for the visionaire technology. But also of, uh, of importance is they, they've also contracted with the company to get the 30-year knee. Mm -hmm. And the 30-year knee is not a marketing gimmick. This is special material that when tested in the lab to simulate 30 years of wear, it holds up. Mm -hmm. And the, the FDA has approved this company to label this knee as a 30-year knee. Wow. And, and I'm pleased to offer that to patients at Brunswick Novant Medical Center. And it, to me, it's worth a drive, a little bit of extra time driving to go down and operate at Brunswick Novant Medical Center and to round on the patient's post-op to give them the best parts. I think they deserve it. That's wonderful to hear. I'm, I'm so happy that, that you're um, pleased with the, the services that provi are provided to you at Brunswick Novant Medical Center. I am. I, I truly Center. am. It's, we have a great team. It's a beautiful great. facility. The patients, a lot of them, I've brought patients from Jacksonville and from Wilmington and of course patients from, from uh, Brunswick County, but mm -hmm. some of them have never seen the hospital before. They're not sure what to think, mm -hmm. but I have had excellent reviews from the patients. They recommend the hospital to their friends. Uh, overall, we've, we've been very, very pleased. Great. Well, it was a pleasure having you here today. Please let our viewers know how they can reach you and to schedule an appointment or an evaluation. Sure. I'd be happy to, to go ahead and, and have them call the, the clinic at 910-341-3455. Great. Well, that sounds wonderful. And thank you so much for being here today. It was a pleasure to meet you. And um, it was interesting, very interesting yeah, to cool. learn about all these new products. It's cool stuff. Thanks. It is cool stuff. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for tuning in to ATMC TV's Health Watch. I hope this information was beneficial for you and your family. If you have any questions or topics that you would like to see discussed on a future show, please email them to atmctv at atmc.coop. For more information on Brunswick Novant Medical Center, visit brunswicknovant.org. Thank you again for joining us today. 
Be sure to join us next time for Health Watch on ATMC TV.